Welcome back to Lawrence Weekly Daily Wednesday, where we sit back, relax, hey take that midweek break, and talk about just some of the fun things that we found going on in the world of Floss, open source, and you know it. Linux, I'm Vin, that's Jill, that's Pedro, <laughs> and you at home, Hello. watching us live. It's kind of brilliant. Uh, we got a gang of stuff to cover this week. Have you been up to anything fun? Jill, mm -hmm. what do you got? What, oh, are you, what are you up to? Yeah. So I've uh, enjoyed watching video coverage from the Southeast Linux Fest last weekend from fellow podcasters like um, uh, Noah Chelia from the Ask Noah Show, uh, Rocco from Big Daddy Linux, and the hosts of Destination Linux. And that was a lot of, uh, really a lot of fun. That's one of my favorite things to do uh, for those Linux conventions I'm not attending is to watch all the videos. <laughs> And read all the things. <laughs> yeah, I get on kicks like that. A lot of times it's like DEF CON and I, I, it's like watching old mm -hmm. movies because I'm like watching DEF CON like 2012. And I'm like, oh, I remember that classic. Yes. And that was a thing. That's really yeah. cool. Pedro, did you get another mm -hmm. Z on laptop? No, no, no. Still using the very mm -hmm. same one. But I did get rid of one of my uh, older laptops. It was an old um, Lenovo? This is like one of the big ones when uh, I, it was like the, it wasn't even a T series. It was just, it, it, it was old. It was neat at the time I thought. And, uh, but someone needed it. And Nori is like, so do you have a laptop you can give away? Uh, yeah. Cause one of my coworkers <laughs> needs a laptop and she can't afford one. It's like, all right, find the most powerful laptop I have that I'm willing to part with right here. <laughs> Take it. You, you didn't look, look right there and slap the lid of the like stack that you have. I was like, nope, can't spare any right now. <laughs> <laughs> See, I realize I, you know, I, I have a bit of a hoarding problem, but yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> definitely getting started with one, my man. Um, I've been playing with a lot of stuff, uh, Pulse Audio, also loopback devices and stuff like this, because it's been messing around with their audio chain, um, tightening up latency. But that wasn't the big thing that like mess, messed up my week, like <laughs> Sunday afternoon. It might have been Monday morning, somewhere like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. I discovered that Black Magic <laughs> straight up made a thing that is affordable ish as opposed to like a thousand dollars i was telling pedro earlier it's like i wish that thing was a thousand dollars like why because then i was just like nope yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like a multi h it's four hdmis and uh like we can do a lot of stuff uh hdmi 2.0 so 4k new hd 60, at 60 ferps four at one time and it's 500 bucks which is ludicrous but not that ludicrous i don't know <laughs> prepare to hear me go hmm i'm thinking about that for like another month then i'll eventually get around to do it because there's it's, it's got what vin craves it's an aspirational item for the show anyway Let's get right into it. Uh, Linux has been attacked. We need to uninstall it and put on Windows XP, right? Uh, actually, no. You need to run like <laughs> a single uh, command in the terminal. Uh, but, well, we talked about Hidden Wasp not too long ago, and we said, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's not a big deal because the system is already Pedro, compromised what, at that while you're, point. While you're just promoting this FUD, man. This is clearly not an issue. Uh -huh. um, you need to quit giving <laughs> but, problems coverage. Yeah. Hidden Wasp was not as big an issue as people made it out to be, but this, this is, yeah. <laughs> this uh, not only affects Linux kernels, it affects BSD kernels, uh, and there's a couple of uh, vulnerabilities, I think there were three of them, with the mm -hmm. single most uh, egregious one being the fact that it can cause a kernel panic on a Linux kernel, and it can be triggered remotely. So, this... Right here, this is an example of an actual problem. It can be triggered remotely, it can cause a kernel to panic with very little input from the user, and it's being actively exploited right now. Mm. Uh, the patches are already out, so if you got a patch for a kernel that's not like within the same cadence as they usually tend to come, this is what that fixes. Uh, and it's... Yeah, th this... This is a problem because we know how people are exploiting it. We know what people are targeting. We know that mm. it is a viable exploit and a, a remote exploit at that. So, yeah, it, it only causes a denial of service or a kernel panic in the case of Linux. 
which, you know, all things considered is probably minimal, but it wouldn't take much to go from that to use that particular buffer overflow to escape the RAM sandbox that the browser or whatever it is that triggers this vulnerability is uh, currently running in. So, yeah, this this is a problem. <laughs> it's something you should get fixed, and I, I think every major, even minor distribution, like, push that out. Like, whoa. I want to give some credit to Netflix, though, because they, they were like, yo, we found this. And Netflix has yep. done a lot of work <laughs> yeah. on the Linux side, especially with the networking stuff, because that's what their back end's running on. Like, I remember yeah. way back when, when they released Chaos Monkey as open source, and I was like, that's really neat. But get this fixed. Uh, if you don't have a patch for it, check out our show notes. It's really easy with a uh, you can do a sysctl uh, thing with your. I don't, does it affect IPv6? No, no. it's in the IPv4 uh, TCP SAC. Hmm. What about? <laughs> yeah. Okay, I didn't see this addressed anywhere. Maybe no more on this. Is what about routers? Uh, routers, if they're running a free BSD kernel, yes. If not, no. Hmm. hmm. Yeah. That's the <laughs> cool. Jill, are you terrified? Are you updated? Petrified? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Just make sure to patch your sack. <laughs> <That's>... Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Very good, Jill. <laughs> All right. Um the internet is very happy about this exciting development from Canonical. Uh, I386 architecture will be dropped starting with what is it, nineteen ten. Um this, this is great. This, this is the future, you guys. Uh, nothing uses i 380s We're not talking about, you know, just the compatible. Everything's gone boom. I mean, this is going to blow out everything. Maybe some people are going to have a problem with this. I know uh, we're going to talk about this more in depth on Saturday because mm -hmm. there's a lot of games compiled 32-bit yes. only, and we're never <laughs> going to. Oh, look, it was pinned by Popey. Hi, Popes. Probably watching. Uh, <laughs> No, to be serious about this, uh, there's going to be some problems with this. There's going to be some growing pains, I definitely mm -hmm. think. And if I had to play the Flying Spaghetti Monsters advocate, I'm going to have to say this is something that's got to take place at some point. It has to. And yeah. you know, much like Waylon, eventually, maybe 10 years from now, uh, someone's going to have to take that first wave of bullets to do this and like it, hate it, or hate it more. This is definitely one way to accelerate finding out what that future will look like. Yeah. Well, yeah, you know, we've there been was talking about it for a while. Go ahead, Pedro. <laughs> no, go ahead, Jill. You started. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have been talking about... Um, this since the release of Ubuntu 18.04 LTS being the last release to support i386. So we knew this was actually coming. And Linus had deprecated i386 from the Linux 3.8 kernel back in 2012. So a lot of us knew this was, was coming. And it is, it is actually sad. It's the end of an era. But I'm sure there will be other distros that, that um, uh, pull in the reins like Debian. <laughs> Yeah, well, oh, I awesome. guess uh, like we were talking about this in the uh, the pre-show, I said, yeah, Debian's not going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. But one of the things that Will Cook said mm -hmm. is like, there are a number of ways that 32-bit applications can continue to be made available uh, to users of later Ubuntu releases. Uh, and he specifically mentions in that little uh, Q&A thing that he posted... Um, which is uh, LXD containers, which if you don't know what it is, think uh, the the way that Chrome mm. OS currently handles Linux applications, it's like a container a hybrid between a container and a virtualized environment. And basically, that's the canonical interpretation of it. It's the LXD containers and Snap packages. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that came to mind is like, oh, if you're using mm -hmm. this as an excuse or a desperate hurrah to shove snaps down people's throats, this isn't going to end well. Uh, this is going to generate a poop storm the likes only, I guess, the <laughs> Unity desktop has ever seen. Yes. <laughs> and if you remember the kind of poop storm that that was... This is going to be worse, unless you handle it really well, which has not been the case when it comes to Canonical. 
in past. I, I genuinely don't think this is a Trojan snap show title. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I get beat up a lot because I'll, I'll come to the fence at Canonical and be like, it's good some people are doing this. This is something that's got to get done one way or the other. Maybe snaps aren't the way to do it, but we're going to have to find something to do it. Oh, I'm sure this will poke all the holes into all of the weakest spots and whatever yeah. breaks is going to break hard. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. um, grab some popcorn, sit back, and hey. Oh, yes. Since we're going to be talking about snaps, uh, another thing from Canonical. Ubuntu devs are testing Chromium browser because they're going to transition it from the tired, old, broken, useless Debian package format to the new, shiny, uh, top-of-the-line snap package. And, ladies and gentlemen, mm. this is a firm plan that will not be yeah. debated. <laughs> no. So, you know, uh. I'm, I <laughs> got to give them credit, man. With 1910, this is going to roll out. Uh, Canonical is not the only uh, team that likes to test in production. As somebody who enjoys testing in production, good on you, Lud. Uh, brave very brave um pedro look there's something to mm -hmm. be said about running applications natively and from a security standpoint i get it because having it inside the snap uh creates that extra bit of sandboxing thing is i really don't need chromium stuff using more ram and cpu cycles than they already do or giving it the excuse to be any slower than it needs to be. And putting it in a snap will do everything I just mentioned. You just hate yeah. him, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and just like Pedro said, I, I'm actually really concerned about how well Jitsi that we're using now here at Linux Gamecast and other WebRTC services will run in a Chromium browser snap. Because, because you know, memory is definitely an issue. And I know that the Discord app has issues with audio video conferencing in the Snap app, let alone problems natively with the Electron app. So, you know, it's it's definitely I'm I'm a, I am concerned about it because Chromium, you know, we live off Chromium. <laughs> and yeah, I need it as me we need it as memory efficient as possible. Mm. We need Firefox to uh, actually figure out WebRTC and implement it. Properly. Yes, there's that too. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. After they get done, like firmly baking in Jack. Yes, I know you can build Firefox with Jack support, <laughs> but it only half works. Um, <laughs> it's going to be interesting. It's going to be a learning experience. That's for sure. If I'm looking at it from like um, you know, being democratic about it. Uh, it's probably not going to be a good time for a minute. Uh, you're going to take that performance hit because, you know, if you're running on a modern system with an SSD, especially with an NVMe, you can always spot that you don't have to tell anyone what is. And I'm not pooing on snaps. This isn't a legitimate issue. This is yeah. when I put 19, what was it, 1910? Or 19, 1904. 1904 on. I immediately went, mm -hmm. why did calculator not immediately open? Followed by, why, why did GNOME system monitor immediately? These are legitimate before I looked at anything. Then I went DF and I was like, oh, well, mm -hmm. that, yeah, maybe that'll get fixed <laughs> yeah. in the future. Like right now, you can absolutely make the use case for snaps on the server side. I'm like, that oh, yeah. Kind of makes yeah, sense. You need Container, a specific yeah. application. Yeah. I, I get it's that. Updated. Just yeah. Desktop facing. It's going to need some work. I don't, I'm going to need some mm -hmm. convincing. I wish we knew somebody we could talk to about it. But dang. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's an invite, son. Uh, <laughs> GNU Linux Risk 5 64 port uh, mid 2019. This is our future. Yeah. No, this is actually really cool. This is, um, and here's the an update on the status of the RISC 5 64 Debian port. And um, it, what's really nice is they have graphs that show um, how much they've completed and um, converting over the packages. So 90% of the packages have been transitioned to the RISC 5 64 port with the exception of Rust applications, which includes Firefox and LLVM applications. And, you know, there are over 500 packages from the Rust ecosystem in the Debian archive, which makes up about 4% of the archive, and they can't be converted until there is a Rust, is Rust support for RISC 5. So, you Isn't know, this right, is... Chad? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that graph. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that graph. <laughs> so um, Debian, you know, it's the Swiss army knife of distros. And because of its risk genealogy and continued support for the risk architecture, such as with Spark and Deck Alpha, that were listed on those graphs as uh, some of the uh, ports they are drawing from, from the for the risk five port, you know, the risk five transition is much further along and is one of the reasons that Debian is so well suited for it because they have such a, a, a history and again, genealogy in the risk architecture from years ago. So, you yeah. know, this, this is, it's really, they're really coming along if they're already 90% of the way, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> well, it's uh, it's certainly better than the Itanium uh, support, but uh, <laughs> before I get to that, you know, uh, before I'm going to throw Intel under the bus, they tried, man. They they did. They, they was like, yeah. let's they break backwards compatibility. <laughs> let's let's. Since we're talking about killing 32-bit, I thought that was uh, you know relevant. Yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> but it's uh, having the software support in place for when Risk Five. And mm -hmm. specifically, the price of Risk Five eventually drops to something that's not, you know, completely mental. Uh, it, it's probably a very good idea. But yeah, I was looking at that graph, and I'm seeing the i64 um, graph, and it's like, oh, okay, it rises to like 76 percent, and then it tanks back down to 70. Mm -hmm. It's like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> what happened there? <laughs> Pointed that out. Code freeze. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, see. Right. <laughs> yeah, because they go from you know stable to tested to untested, so they freeze. Yeah. Okay. The stable. <laughs> Pretty yeah. interesting. I'm um, always looking forward to more development on Risk Five, and a lot of companies are too. Because hey, man, it's like having your arm and eating it too without paying for licensing. Um, yep. <laughs> yeah. Definitely going to see some adoption. I'm sure that. Huawei would uh, is foaming at the mouth right now. It's like, can we have Risk Five? Yeah, no? no. Okay. okay. Well, well, hey, we got a couple little updates to GIMP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So GIMP 2.10.12 has been released, and a lot of bug bugs have been fixed since the major refactoring of GIMP 2.10.10. And but this release also comes with some cool new features. Like the curves tool has had a major update and now has the ability to use numeric input to set coordinates of points on a curve for more accuracy. And a new sharp or corner control point has been added to the curves tool. So now you can combine sharp and smooth points on a single curve for greater flexibility of editing your photos and images. And what's really cool is the TIFF format now has layer support when exporting instead of having to be merged. So now you have another way to import layers into other programs in, instead of just with the XFCE format. So that's 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 actually a huge, huge for interoperability interoper between the different graphics programs and animation programs. It's really awesome. Yeah, and one of the things that they point out is that uh, they don't have any, uh, no one in the development team uses Mac or Windows. So yeah. if you are a Mac or Windows software developer mm -hmm. and you like GIMP, give these guys a bit of a nudge because they need your help. And uh, they say it's like, yeah, the Linux version works pretty well and it's pretty stable. On Mac and Windows, not so much, but we don't have anyone who can work on those right now. So yeah, we need help. So that's mm -hmm. one of the things that give they pointed yeah. out is uh, with the Windows version, you can now have user fonts, which is like, wow, that yeah. wasn't a thing? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they yes. didn't know. It's like, oh, that's not working. Oops. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good on them. Good on them. <laughs> so uh, I, like everyone else, enjoy downloading the occasional Linux ISO. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. We're always looking for pieces mm -hmm. of kit uh, that will enhance our Linux ISO downloading experience. Mm -hmm. I suppose. Uh, I guess a faster internet connection helps, but uh, let's say you're getting those ISOs from, I don't know, the Linux tracker, uh, and you need to use a BitTorrent client to get it. Well, chances are you probably know Deluge. It's been around for a while. Um, this one I can't I remember what... the first thing off the bat. I'm a little curious about multi-user support. I mean, mm -hmm. I guess it it takes um, 
multiple user profiles if you don't want other people to know oh, about sweetheart your... i understand that i'm I, 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm deep in the field of like why <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, just have, you know, yeah. multi-user support as in a uh, different user logs in and they can use Deluge without it mm. screaming. I don't know. But yeah, they yeah. also updated the performance uh, mm. to handle thousands of torrents. Uh, the There's a new uh, console UI um, that emulates the uh, GTK and web UIs if you are so inclined. And it, it, it makes it more familiar, so I guess it would help. Uh, they migrated the GTK UI to GTK3, about damn time, let's nice. be honest. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the uh, magnet, uh, if you hit a magnet link, it, it can actually prefetch everything uh, and allow you to pick which files you want to download instead of just, oh, is that a magnet link? You're downloading everything. Okay. Mm. Uh, and yeah, they support uh, language switching, which... How was that not a thing before? And uh, the auto add <laughs> plugin uh, is now separate. It's no longer like built in functionality. It's just a plugin. So if you don't want to have auto add enabled by default, you can just get rid of it. So, what's your biggest issue with the Delugi? <laughs> uh, plugins. Plugins? It, it, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's a. Uh, it's a BitTorrent magnet well, handler. I mean, sometimes thing. your Linux ISO mm -hmm. will come in like multi-part raw archives, and you got to plug into. <laughs> yeah, but it's still <laughs> just the one torrent or the one magnet link. Which you don't it, have it, to use plugins; it's just a framework to put them in. They don't, it doesn't come preloaded. Yeah, no, but transmission, transmission, you can't even use plugins, and it downloads things pretty good. So that that. That's what I use. <laughs> so it's more lightweight and it does its one function better? Uh, yeah, given its one function is to download peer-to-peer -peer okay. connection uh, shared mm -hmm. files. Yes. So this is like the XFC KDE comparison, right? Do you really want to compare an entire desktop environment to a BitTorrent client? I just did, oh. son. Were you not paying attention? <laughs> Because if you want to go down that road, yeah, we can go down that road. <laughs> I know you can. You're more than capable of it. <laughs> With minimal product. Yeah. Well, well, speaking of that, there used to be an ISO that would boot automatically to a BitTorrent client. I think it was QTorrent, actually. <laughs> and that was yeah. the user interface. <laughs> so they QBitTorrent is totally yeah. a thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, like uh, Pedro was saying... Um, um, I love the performance updates of of the load times when when handling lots of torrents. Uh, this that is awesome because that's always been one of my biggest complaints. So there's a lot of a lot of the torrent clients that I've used is that they all all uh, are usually have very slow loading times, and that's can be really annoying. Transmission. Yeah, Tra and and I have also Modern used transmission. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Transmission, Views, WebTorrent, Qubit Torrent, and the command line torrent client, RTorrent, I really like. And RTorrent is actually really fast. And so is Transmission, which comes Transmission CLI. with a bunch oh, of... Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I think it's a good That's idea. A I'm re really happy about the magnet being able to select, because, you know, a lot of times Linux ISOs will yeah. come with, like, cover art and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm. And readme files yeah. and whatnot. Yeah. And subtitles. And I'm like, I don't need subtitles for my Linux. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's good yeah. to be able to pull all that. Good work. Good work. And um, yeah. Deluge is what I use. So it's awesome. And mm -hmm. I genuinely, like, in all seriousness, I couldn't defend it one way or the other. I'm like, it, it does its thing. It doesn't matter. So mm -hmm. brilliant. Yeah. No, this is one of those yeah. things that I really don't care. It's like, oh, Transmission, it downloads things. You know, cool. Yeah. Pedro, I've, I've seen you pick stupider fights, though, so I thought I could go you in. Time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good news, everyone. Um, CERN, you might know them, uh, creators of head crabs and um, crowbars, maybe not. Migrating to possible destroyers of the whole world. Micro oh, no. black holes. Oh, no. It's taking back control <laughs> using open software. That is right, because they have the Microsoft Alternatives Project, ladies and gentlemen, and it does doesn't look like they're doing a bargaining uh, move to get a better deal from um, granddaddy Microsoft. So basically what happened, mm -hmm. the, the software thing came up, 
for renewal. And Microsoft's like, you know what? We don't believe you're an academic uh, license is valid anymore because you're CERN and you don't do any of that academic stuff. So you got to pay the iron price. And, you know, CERN kind of walked up, whispered in the air. It's like, yo, we've been working to replace you for like already a year, bro. Bye bye. Um, yeah, <laughs> 100%. I mean, it, it is uh, really a unique opportunity for CERN to demonstrate that you know, they can build core services with uh, no vendor or data lock in. You know, like I said, they launched Malt a year ago just to investigate the migration from Microsoft to, you know, just getting off that and non commercial and using open source solutions, which is completely viable. It's not going to be easy. It's not. And that has nothing to do with open source. Mm-hmm. That's just going from thing A to thing B. B, uh, if I really, I, I got to think, maybe it wasn't the open source so much. Maybe this was just their way of avoiding Skype for business. <laughs> <laughs> See, Skype for business yeah. is actually going away. Uh, Microsoft is actively working to replace it with Microsoft Teams. Uh, yes. <laughs> it is basically merging Skype for business with mm-hmm. Slack Mm. And it's like, oh, it's a, it's a, it's a monster, is what it is. Uh, but one of the really awesome things that CERN have been doing is ever since we talked about uh, scientific Linux is going away, and they have um, started working to get sent up to speed. So I very much look for, I'm very much looking forward uh, to CERN turning sent into a proper enterprise desktop OS. I want to see that. Oh, I really do. Yeah. <laughs> really good point, Pedro. Yeah, and I this is wonderful. So, you know, CERN is now paying attention to what is going on over at NASA and SpaceX and seeing the progressive nature that open source can offer. And, you know, most most scientists are using Linux now. So, you know, this just really really makes sense. And I'm I'm very was very happy to hear this. This was an is an awesome Awesome story. <laughs> and, you know, listen, it, it, it always gives you a little bit of the feel good when yeah. um, a, a group or a company or any <laughs> educational foundation or research institute is like, bye-bye, Microsoft. <laughs> bye-bye. <Yeah. laughs> it's kind of brilliant. Uh, hey, one Microsoft story, because we do know Microsoft, in fact, loves Linux. <laughs> yes, and uh, yeah. who would have thunk it that uh, when you joked about going um, going to the Linux store and getting a Linux Listen, bin, man, that that store would be owned by Microsoft? We, we are not there. I, <laughs> yeah. I want to install seven <laughs> Linux. Right now, I well, can only install three Linux. You can install Linux. three. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can install three because uh, besides Ubuntu on the, um, on the Windows store, you can now also Rated get e um, from everyone. Yep. Okay, all right. uh, they yes. all have ESRB ratings. Tap uh, it out, tap it out. We <laughs> we we have a response, nay, a duty to do our own distro that's rated uh, NC seventeen or whatever the highest adult R R. Uh, so uh yeah apparently now uh besides ubuntu and you could already like all the debian based uh distros you could finagle your way into them like kali linux you could get that working on the windows uh subsystem for linux now you can also get open suzy and fedora which is two whole rpm distros it's like you know they they had ubuntu i was thinking like oh Debian proper, yeah. like official yeah. support for Debian proper, mm-hmm. or um, I don't know, really anything else but Fedora and Suzy. I guess Suzy I can kind of see given Microsoft's history with the uh, Novell. From wanting making to keep it uh, people on Windows happy with Windows and not to completely move, that makes perfect sense because you're going to be dealing with oh, yeah. Suzy and Enterprise. You're going to be dealing, <laughs> well, not Red Hat, but Fedora close enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and Fedora is like, oh, I actually like Fedora, so I know what I'm doing yeah. tomorrow at work. There you go. <laughs> Losing and blowing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, that, that's kind of brilliant. So before we get out of here, uh, I think mm-hmm. this is going to be, if not the last or second to last uh, interview from Remember Scale 30 years ago. Jill went there. <laughs> And you talked with the co-founder of Inkscape. So give us a little primer yeah. on uh, what we're about to pull up. Okay. 
This is our Scale 17X interview of Ted Gould, co-founder of Inkscape, talking about the upcoming Inkscape 1.0 release, which is now an alpha. And um, there have been, there's already been several Inkscape hack fests, including in conjunction with Scale 17X and uh, several talks that they gave at Scale. But recently, there was an Inkscape workshop meeting meetup at the Lieber Graphics Meeting 2019 convention held in Germany, where they showed off the new features of upcoming Inkscape 1.0. And, you know, there, Inkscape is always looking for contributions, testers, and donations. So download the Inkscape 1.0 alpha app image and have fun. It's, it's really awesome. So uh, here is uh, Ted Gould, co-creator of Inkscape. Hello, and we're here from the Inkscape booth. And Inkscape, as everyone knows that watches our shows, is one of my favorite pieces of software. Awesome. Any alternative to Adobe Illustrator, <laughs> I'm a fan of. <laughs> and um, I'm here with Ted Gould, who has been here at Scale for many years. I know him through the Linux Chicks. And um, they're going to be having a new release soon, as we've talked about on the show, version 1.0. So can you t tell us a little bit about it? So it's, it's pretty exciting for us because we've uh, never had a 1.0. We've kind of just, you know, we've kind of gone up with the versions. A lot of people think version 92 is actually version 9.2 uh, because yeah. nobody goes to version 92. <laughs> so I guess, you know, for being developers, we're pretty bad at counting. Um, but the big change I think people will really notice is that it's actually a transition to GTK3. And GTK3 provides a pluggable backend. So we can actually yes. get on OS X without um, X quartz. And it also means you can do things like high DPI on Linux. Um, so I think that's will be the, probably the biggest change that people know. There's also a ton of new live path effects, new extensions. All the things you come to expect from Inkscape are bigger and better, new alignment dialogues and stuff like that. But um, awesome. I think the big change will be the fact that it's just the newer themes and the higher DPI. Oh, cool. And just so, so you know, this logo, it's, it, it's, it's kind of an in-joke. Huh? We call it strawberry mayo. <laughs> but, but Ben Stone, um, who runs the... Linux Game Cast Network did this in Inkscape. Oh, very cool. So, yeah, actually, because uh, he's learning Inkscape. Uh, we had a, uh, I don't know if you know Martin Duffy, Martin Duffy, but she's a, a Red Hat designer, and she did a t shirt class for Girl Scouts in oh. Inkscape. And so they did a program for Girl Scouts <laughs> to do um, uh, like a band. It was similar to you got a band, you got to do a CD cover and a t shirt. Yeah. And you got them all printed. And oh, all, cool. the, all those materials are on her <laughs> website for the people out there who want to make a t shirt or do a program with kids. Um, she put all the programs out there. Oh, awesome. Oh, that's wonderful. It was a neat program. Oh, cool. So thank you so much, Ted, for talking to us. And we awesome. look forward to interviewing you on Linux Weekly Daily Wednesday. Awesome. When 1.0 is out. <laughs> we're very excited <laughs> about it. Or soon to come out. Okay? Yep. We're, we're getting there. <laughs> okay. Hey, that was pretty cool, pretty interesting, and uh, thank you again, Jill, for uh, getting a hold of everyone at Scale, chasing them down, chaining them up, hey. tying them up, however you want about it, <laughs> you know, bribing them, multiple ways to get interviews, and um, it's pretty cool. Yay. So, uh, we got a slice of pie coming up, but first, uh, hey, you know, if you like our brand of nonsense and kind of believe in supporting independent media, do what Adam did, do what Adam did. Yeah. Become a Patreon. Mm -hmm. We have 118 Yay. beautiful people supporting what we do. Adam now has access to our Discord behind the scenes production meetings, early access to uncut VODs, and like one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning of the show. If you enjoy audio production, video production, I try to do these videos every couple of months. I did a complete walkthrough of our NetJack Ardor recording setup and uh, how you can play the home game. I'm going to be doing some more with uh, podcasting and recording under a door, but it's pretty cool. Definitely a thing. Uh, thanks to all of our beautiful party patrons. Making this possible is the best way to support our mm -hmm. shenanigans. However, Yay. we also have shirts. You know, if you buy like 500 yes. of these, I can get that <laughs> HDMI capture card. That fancy new one goat or um, <laughs> yes. you know, just, just 500 uh, because we are actually selling these so you can get them, not so we can make money off of them. I thought that was a lot cooler than charging $28 for a t-shirt. Let's be fair. Yeah. We got a couple of mugs yeah. and stuff like that. Uh, speaking of that, we got a wish zone. If you're mm -hmm. curious about stuff we plan on buying, there it oh, is. there it is. Yeah, there it is. 500. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I have to look at it. Not bad. Uh, yeah, I know, Jill, <laughs> but even to me, logically, I see that 545 and I'm like, you know, technically that's cheap. And I'm like, yeah, I know it's still 500 bucks, man. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all the stuff we're planning on buying. But if you're curious about uh, everything in the studio, 
we have a little Amazon, I don't, influencer. Th- it's, it's all on Linux Zemecast. Go to the about page. It's there. You can see everything that uh, we've put together, hopefully mm-hmm. to satisfy. Can you tell what I've been looking at lately? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> <nope>. Yes. <laughs> this, what have you been looking at? Uh, is that mango sauce? Mango sauce, baby. That's all yeah. I've been looking at, man. Uh, 100%. Um, hey, thanks again uh making this possible this is kind of fun we got uh we get to do a lot more and we plan on doing a lot more oh it's it's gonna be an adventure it is all right cool uh and thanks again adam hi say hi to adam jill hey adam we love you and if you go back and turn into <laughs> uh turn into last week's uh <laughs> guest weekly uh pedro had a fun fact about adam that even himself was unaware of <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing that popped into my Amen. head so don't read too much yeah. into this. <laughs> something we get to do for new people it is kind of brilliant uh it's that time again ladies and gentlemen yeah for a slice of pie version 1.9 slice of pie Ooh. Yo, that was good. You even got oh, that was a good find, Ben. That picture. A pie breadboard, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so this is the Nano Pie Server. Uh, uh, oh, excuse me. Uh, this is. <laughs> I was reading the the show topic. Uh, we talked talked about the Node Mini Server version two using a Raspberry Pi three and a 2.5 inch hard drive and other components inside a tiny 3D printed case in May. Now here is the Node Nano Server version 2 using a universal adapter which transforms a Raspberry Pi Zero W into a tiny network connected server. Simply plug it into a wall outlet for use as a compact server that can you, you can use for decentralized web applications as a Pi Hole, as a NAS, as a mini home entertainment PC, or whatever else you like. And what's really cool is currently the nano server kit and pre-assembled nano servers are sold out, but more are on the way. And uh, he did a, he does really great videos. And th- this is a uh, really good job on these videos explaining it all. So definitely uh, go check that out if you'd like to pick up one. I'm going to say 100% <laughs> looking at this, uh, you could even pre-order. I mean, if you don't want to mess around with anything, it's at yeah. NODE yeah. Um, shop. This would be in the credits and uh, not credit show notes yeah. and all that. Uh, mm-hmm. This is one of those pieces of kit that you would love to have in your house, but hate to yeah. find. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's small. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. If you did have this in your house, you'd plug it into that socket <laughs> that never gets used and you just forget about it. Mm-hmm. It just yeah. be there the whole time. And then you'd say, a second, didn't I buy one of those, uh, node nano servers? Oh yeah, let's go into the browser. Oh yeah, there it is. You, you genuinely okay. gotta be careful <laughs> with stuff like that. I have lost. <laughs> I've done. I'm sure that's a web comic, but I, I've had IPs. I was like, "What is that?" All right, mm-hmm. we got an association to that. I was like, "Where are you? What do you do? <laughs> What's your mm-hmm. name?" You gotta be careful hiding <laughs> stuff like pies and things like that. I was genuinely like looking in the other day to putting Jackbox in the rack because I got a 19 inch audio, and I was like, "Okay." You- it can be neglected if it's back in the corner. If it's in the rack, it will be forgotten about. And uh, I'll, <laughs> it's a thing. Yeah. It's there. Cool. I don't need to think the, about the, it. <laughs> the next time I get maintenance would be, oh, it doesn't cut on. Hmm. Guess I better pull that out. Hmm. Mm-hmm. It's probably not a good idea. Hey, maybe you got some thoughts, hints, allegations, things better left unsaid. You want to tell us about it? We got something right. Got something wrong. You got a project. You just mm-hmm. want to scream out. You can do that. Uh, how do they do it, Pedro? <laughs> you can scream. That is totally a valid thing. But the best way to do it oh, is to save you do yourself. That, go watch Pedro. He did pretty good last night on uh, Dark Souls. It didn't crash. It didn't crash. Yeah. It was Dark Souls that didn't well. crash. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. But uh, if you'd like to, let us know what other games uh, you'd like to see. Maybe me, maybe Jordan, maybe Ven. Uh, you can go to the contact page, fill the form. Make sure to submit for LWDW, that's uh, this show right now, and we do want your feedback, make no mistake, if it weren't mm-hmm. for you lot, everyone watching, we wouldn't be doing this show, <laughs> so, hey. Uh, I'm busy, Ben's sorry. making a hangman. <laughs> ben is making ass key art. Yes. <laughs> Lead hacks, bro. 
<laughs> lead access. Um, <laughs> cool. We didn't get any. Well, we got some this week, but it was simple questions. You can always send it in a simple question. Hit us on Twitter or something like that. And we'll get back to you. Uh, but we got to get out of here and get the oh, business yeah. done. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's been fun. It's been real. <laughs> but we got to roll them credits. Hey. It's going to be a thing. Oh, no. Maybe. <laughs> Is it gonna happen? Here, they come. Here they come. Here they come. You can hear them. You can yes. Hear them. That's how you do a credit circle. <laughs> wop wop. Aw. Thank you, Ben Stone. And thank you, Pedro Mateus. And very much appreciated, Jill. <laughs> Who's Jill? I don't know, this Linux girl apparently she even won an Emmy at some point. I, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Get a game. Thank you to our producers <laughs> and executive producers. <laughs> Let's just do We this. love you. Can you think how much we've like technically grown production wise and our ability to deliver stuff ever since we like hey man, no, let's do a Patreon. Yeah. yeah. Yay. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. an exercise. Go back and watch we some of the old you. episodes. <laughs> the ones with puppets are particularly